as you know, our, our uh, presenter here is David McCauley. Uh, David McCauley doesn't need an introduction, so I won't give him one. <laughs> but at least not a, a conventional one. I'm sure that many people here know his great books, have read them with their kids, and enjoy them as adults. When my daughter and son were kids, they only sporadically read the books, unfortunately. But as adults, both of them teachers, they immensely value the books. My son remembers when he taught fourth and fifth graders the appeal of Pyramid and a companion video which enthralled his students. A favorite was the Motel of the Mysteries, in which archaeologists of the future mistakenly interpret a present-day motel as a funeral and temple complex, including the hilarious idea of the uses of a toilet bowl, which kids love. Then the, the book Mill, about the evolution of New England and its villages, also fascinated his students. My daughter is both an elementary school teacher and librarian, so she had used, has used Macaulay books in the classroom and as library recommendations. She counts cathedral and castle as classics and says kids who are interested in engineering and construction love them. The science teacher in school values the way we work. Teachers who are parents are particularly fond of the way things work. Now David McCauley has a new book, Crossing on Time, which he presents to us today. And there are no mammoths in this book, but there's a little kid, and he'll tell us about it. What a great day to be doing a slideshow in an attic. Um, Crossing on Time is my first attempt to sort of combine a little autobiography, history, writing history, which I, you know, sort of try to avoid, um, technology, building a ship, and biography, telling the story of the designer and builder of the ship, the United States telling that story because it's the ship that covered my mother and brother and sister and I across the Atlantic in 1957. Um, so, the way things work, it's just great. Hey, okay, we're off. All right, this is the town. Um, in which I, this is Bolton, Lancashire, England, industrial town, and um, a pretty colorful place, as you can see. This was bef before the Clean Air Act, and um, this is my street. This is a joke, actually, and we're so far beyond it now that it's almost not worth telling the joke. But you can see on our street, in, in no relationship to the previous one where there were no trees, we had a tree. We actually had two trees. They stood very close together, so it looks like one tree. Um, <laughs> This is the town I grew up in, and I, I loved being a child here. It was really a, a wonderful place to grow up because the houses, all in a row, very small, um, family of five. My mother was only too pleased when I would leave the house and go play somewhere, go play almost anywhere. And she never worried about it because it was perfectly safe. I loved it because we had woods at the bottom of our street, it was a little stream, walked through the woods on the way to school every day and back for lunch and then back to school in the afternoon and that sort of stuff. It was a magical place to grow up and it is where I spent, it's where I was a child. Then we moved to New Jersey and everything was different. I was not the baby, I was the oldest and first and the best of the bunch. I mean, <laughs> ask my mother drives my brother and sister crazy. She has, does show a little bit of favoritism. I still don't know why, but nevertheless, I guess being first. Um, the story of a journey, basically. A longer journey than I had anticipated. Um, a journey from England to the United States. And the reason we made the journey, my father was offered a job. This is much different than the last talk you just heard. I mean, it was easy. My father was offered a job. They said, how much would you need to be paid? My father and my mother conspired to come up with a salary that they just thought was outrageous. 
which they accepted and said, fine, let's start making plans so we can get you to New Jersey to run a knitting plant for us with these new machines that had been developed in Nottingham in England. And um, that was the beginning of the adventure. Why is this map upside down? Because I want you to read the pages always from left to right. I don't want the journey to change direction. Now, for me to show this map accurately, I have to move us from right to left, which I didn't want to do. That's the reason for this. Um, all I knew about America was the Empire State Building. And I knew it because in my uh, book of science for boys and girls was this illustration of the Empire State Building. Look at the size of that building. Forget the fact that it's not quite connected to the skyline of the, of, of the battery down below. Um, this is an illustrator's trick, which I would later learn and use myself. But at the time, I just fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and assumed that this was the size of the Empire State Building. I could not wait to see it. So, the journey, as I said, um, was much longer than I anticipated. It, was, it took us long enough just to get out of Bolton and onto the ship, and then the five-day voyage. Um, but when I began to think about this book, I realized that I really had to tell a much bigger story because the journey was, went back much further, went back to around 1700, um, when they suddenly needed something more reliable than humans and, and oxen and horses or whatever to work the pumps to keep the coal mines free of excess water. Um, once that technology began to develop, of course, um, it, things took off. In the meantime, people still wanted to cross oceans for various reasons, but they were at the mercy of the wind. So that was a, that was a major problem. You could get to the, to the dock, and there would be no ship waiting for you, or there would be a ship waiting for you, but it couldn't go anywhere because there was no wind to move it. Um, I work often on, you know, sort of the composition of a spread uh, over and over and over again until I get something that I think is working. This is the final drawing, and it, again, it, you can see it's a family of almost five, um, of four. Uh, it does reflect my own situation. My father flew ahead to start his job to find us an apartment in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and um, my mother got the the lucky task, she drew the short straw, and um, was able to take the three of us on the, on the ship with two steamer trunks full of all our belongings, um, and she was seasick the entire time. Yeah. Um, here's that mine I mentioned, coal mine, typical coal mine, flooding, using all kinds of contraptions and devices, some of which were quite ingenious, which is why I in included one, um, to get the water out of there. But with the, with the invention of the, of the steam engine and steam as a source of power, we see for the first time a cylinder, which is always colored yellow in these illustrations, and um, the piston inside it, which moves up and down if the steam expands or contracts, and um, the simple jobs and tasks that it might do. Uh, here's Newcomen's first sort of continuously working steam engine. That first one was kind of experimental. But John, Nuke, Thomas Newcomen came up with one that actually just worked all by itself. You just had to keep throwing coal into the furnace, and if you could do that, you were all set. And if you built this in a coal, a coal mining area, there was plenty of coal, so that was not an issue. Uh, eventually, though, you need a bigger furnace, and the one on the right belongs actually to James Watt's steam engine, much more efficient and so on and so forth. Still burns a ton of coal, literally. Um, but this one was also connected to, to a wheel, which at this point was meant to turn belts and work machines in textile mills and various other uh, industrial situations. As soon as people saw a wheel being turned by the steam engine, they began to think about other uses for it. And of course, one of the most logical was transportation and paddle wheels on ships, paddle wheels that might have been worked manually prior to this. Um, wheels on little devices, uh, little contraptions that actually traveled on land. So instead of pulling a cannon with six horses, you could actually theoretically drag a cannon across uh, the, the terrain with a steam engine, although it never really worked very well. But it was on the boats and ships um, that this technology really found its home. And also um, on land, but it needed tracks. So we've got the beginning of uh, trains, railroads, and all that sort of stuff. But we also have a great variety of, um, of steam boats, basically Fulton's on the right, upper right, uh, Claremont, 
um, and, and so on. I mean, I go through this very quickly. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is that the colors of the engine never change. I mean, you still see the yellow cylinder, and you see the orange um, furnace, for instance. The piston is still in there. Wherever I use that technology, I maintain the color, and you, you, I just change the shape and the size and the scale of the vehicle, which is being moved by it. Sketch layout becomes a little more formal uh, here. Steam engines are developing, the engines themselves, now we have two cylinders side by side. Um, a, the first ship that, to sail across the Atlantic with steam power, um, the Curaçao, um, it's not the Curaçao, it's something else, I forget, anyway, forgot the name of it. Um, more sketches, I'm trying to include lots of boats, but I'm trying to sort of keep this journey across the water moving. Uh, Brunel, with Brunel, Isambard Kingdom, we see the, be the beginning of the building of ships for several hundred people. Um, the first one um, on the bottom was Great, West, was Great Western, which carried about 220 people across the Atlantic, a wooden ship. And above it is, the, is uh, Great Britain, which would carry 330 people across the Atlantic or to wherever. Um, the engines are growing in size. The ships are made of different materials, which is why the background to the water and to the sky here shows at the top the wooden structure of the bottom ship and uh, on the right hand side the, the iron plates of a later ship. As the ships get beyond 200 feet you don't really want to build them out of wood if you're going to send them out across the Atlantic. The stretching and bending and all that sort of stuff will create leaks before you know it so you switch to iron. Um, the ship ends up being roughly the same weight which is interesting. The Great Eastern, Brunel's most famous disaster um, a wonderful ship divided into compartments, which you can see here. Um, each compartment is meant to trap water that might leak into the ship during a voyage. Maybe it runs aground and they do something to the hull. There are a couple of things Brunel did. The compartments he borrowed from Chinese shipbuilders of years before, like centuries earlier, but he also created a double hull. One ship basically inside another, separated by three feet of airspace. Um, this is the first layout for it. The other thing I wanted to do here was this is now almost 700 feet long, so we've really jumped in scale. And I wanted to illustrate the fact that it was big, not by necessarily saying it's 700 feet long and showing it compared to smaller things, but making it, drawing it in such a way that it couldn't fit on the pages. So that's what you see, and that's why I've broken it into the separate compartments. Final drawing looks like this. And the, uh, Everything goes wrong with the Great Eastern that could possibly go wrong, but it does sow that seed in, in the minds of future engineers and maritime architects and so on. Um, so we see the, 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 fault, the, uh, the line of ships that begins to develop around um, before and after even the, the Great Eastern. Um, the engines have to get bigger and bigger because the ships are now getting bigger. They're carrying several hundred more passengers. This is the Servia. For those of you taking notes and have it w willing to take the test later on this afternoon, um, assuming you survive the environmental one we're all experiencing right now, this ship is made of steel. Um, and that's why they consider it the first real ocean liner. Um, and of course it was lighter in steel than the iron ship that preceded it because the plates were thinner. It also had a massive compound engine which is using the steam more than once and um, a new kind of boiler that would more efficiently uh, heat the steam. This is the illustration I decided to use. Uh, and you go through a lot of different variations. Um, the thing that intrigued me, in a way, most about this was that it was one of the first ships with electric power. Um, so that there were electric lights inside rather than swinging oil lamps and stuff like that, which is probably not a great idea. Uh, I still had to get the engines across and the, um, the boiler across, but I didn't just want to do another drawing with yellow cylinders and all that sort of stuff. So I began to think, okay, if this ship is sailing at night so I can show the fact that it's got little tiny lights at the back, maybe I can make one of those constellation drawings where you draw the stars and instead of connecting them to create mythical creatures, you actually connect them to create the most up-to-date technology of the moment. That's where these ideas come from. Sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're just playful, but at least it encourages you to think about what is he doing and why is he doing it. Now we just build the catalog. 
ships are getting bigger, more expensive, more lavishly decorated on the inside, more competition for first class passengers, and more space for steerage passengers as the need for immigration travel uh, increases. Philadelphia, 1894, um, two ships are being built in the US at Cramp Shipyard, uh, the St. Paul and the St. Louis, and a young boy named William Francis Gibbs is taken to the shipyard by his father along with his brother Frederick, who's, he, uh, William Francis is eight years old and his brother is six, to see the launch of the St. Louis. Um, this was the first sketch. I liked it, but I wanted to do something that would maybe a little bit more effectively capture what the image must have been in Gibbs's mind. Eight-year-old Gibbs sees the largest thing he has ever seen and watches it sort of grind down the, the runway into the Delaware River, steam coming out from under the cradle and all that sort of stuff. And, and then the little, the little party that hits it with the bottle of champagne or whatever they used at the time. So the exaggeration of scale here is purely an attempt to capture a little bit of what this eight-year-old boy might have experienced might have remembered, but it made an impression. From that point on, Gibbs was committed to the idea of becoming involved with ships and hopefully eventually building one. So he's in the bathtub reading ship books. He's at Harvard, supposed to be studying all kinds of things, but he spends a fair amount of time in his room uh, rearranging and, and correcting blueprints that he happens to get from um, of British uh, warships. They sail, Frederick, um, his brother, and William Francis on the Lusitania, basically skipping school for a week um, just to experience one of these monsters crossing the ocean. They come back on the Mauritania, the sister ship. At this point we have new technology, we have um, we have, what do we have? That word, turbines, yeah thank you. Um, a, a, a steam turbine, much more efficient use of steam. Um, the only danger with, or problem with the turbine is that you uh, have to slow down the speed of the turbine in order to make the propeller move at a speed which will actually move the ship in the water. Otherwise it will just churn up the water and go nowhere. But unfortunately turbines really work at their most efficient if they're working at high speed. So we'll show you how that problem was solved in a second. William Francis and Frederick working in the sort of attic a space probably similar to this in the summer um, but considerably smaller. And this little sequence, I'm trying to get them right based on the few photographs available. Here we are. That's the final drawing. Um, there were only a few photographs, and I'm sort of trying to be accurate, not that anybody would really care, but uh, this is where it went, working on a, a drafting table. Um, what Frederick is doing while William Francis is designing what he hopes will be the, the largest, fastest, and biggest American built ship ever. Frederick is figuring out the numbers. He's the accountant here, but he's also sort of planning the larger picture. How many ships will they need? Where will they dock this thing? What can they do to make their ex the experience for their passengers different? So they plan on building a new terminal in Montauk, Long Island, and um, this is all, on, and they actually get some backing for it, but unfortunately war breaks out and the whole thing is shelved. After the war, during which time the U.S. government has um, basically uh, taken over a German ship that happened to be parked in Hoboken, New Jersey for safekeeping, little did they know. Um, that was, that's the Vaterland, a huge, spectacular um, German ship. They were very proud of this, pride of the fleet and all that sort of stuff. And suddenly it's sitting up, it's bobbing up and down on the water for years in Hoboken. William Francis and Frederick, who now have a small um, ship b uh, designing business, are given the job of restoring and refurbishing the ship so that it can become a, an American passenger liner, a luxurious American passenger liner. The Germans, needless to say, are not willing to give up the blueprints. They're miffed that this ship has been taken. So what Francis, William Francis and Frederick have to do, and a team of 100, um, is measure every square inch of the ship. This is part of Gibbs's education and it's part of why he was so successful. He never avoided an opportunity to learn about what other people who build ships do and why. And what better way than to actually have to make the measurements to create a whole new set of plans so they could simply turn this thing into a, a 
you know, a moneymaker for United States lines in the United States. This is the ship in the background. It's huge. It's massive. There's a blueprint in front of it that I've traced literally and then put some hands on it. I wanted to sort of show this process of dealing with this giant of having to reduce it to blueprints and then introduce the new boiler technology all on one image. This is something that working on the computer, which I swore most of my life I would never do, uh, makes possible because everything is in layers. And I can, I, there's almost no finished single piece of art for this book. There's certainly no finished piece of art in color. Everything that's finished is in black line, which I then scan. But even the black line drawings are made of tiny pieces put together like a collage so that I can move that furnace in or out or up or down and make sure it's in exactly the right place. So I'm, I've become, um, obviously, a fairly enthusiastic user of, the, of my Macs. And um, until about six months ago when one of them completely fried itself and um, I had to replace it. And I couldn't use any longer... Photoshop elements, which came with my scanner, which I loved because it seemed to me to have the eight things I really needed. Now I'm working on, you know, with Photoshop through the cloud that's like a 10,000 things. And of course, things just changed enough so that I had to, I have to kind of relearn parts of this process. I'm getting there. Um, but the practice, there's no practice time because I'm always on the next book. So, you know, learn while you uh, work urn, I guess. The Malolo and the Four Saints, these are Gibbs's first from scratch ships. Again, he's learning as he's building. He's always using the best technology available. Um, oh, let me just go back one. That little thing in the upper right hand corner, I said we would sh slow down the, the, uh, the turbine, um, not the turbine, but the propeller shaft from the turbine. Those are reducing reduction gears. And those allow us to cut the speed way down from like 5,000 RPM to more like 200 RPM. And then the ship can actually be moved through the water by the propellers. But this is how he's learning. His real desire, of course, though, is to build this biggest ship. He was in his late 20s when he started on that. We're probably into the 30s now, late 30s. Um, and these are the ships that, in his mind, he is competing with. The European ships, it's always the European ships. And they never give up the, the blue riband, you know, the, the award, uh, the honor for having been the fastest ship moving from east to west across the Atlantic. But you always have to, in a ship book, you always have to have at least one scale comparison. So I used the Empire State Building since it was the thing that was motivating me to want to, uh, you know, sort of get to the U.S. as quickly as possible. So it's all in scale, so you can actually follow the lines across the Empire State Building and just take them up and you'll see whether Queen Mary 1300 and something um, and, and so on. Normandy is, is a little over that actually. Normandy is, maybe it's 12. It's 12 something. Uh, and then Queen Mary and then uh, two earlier ships. Gibbs is, at this point, the Gibbs company is working for the Navy designing all these vessels for the war, Second World War now. Um, and he's learning a ton of stuff. He's, he's certainly got access to the most up-to-date information and so on and so forth. Um, and so that fills much of his life. And what he really wants to be doing is doing, um, he wants to be doing passenger liners because that's really, you know, the dream. So he designs the America, 1938. And um, no sooner do they get this thing launched and ready to go than uh, it is taken over by the U.S. Navy for troop carrying because of the, uh, because of the war in 1940. Um, so it gets painted gray. So this illustration was one of those images that had to say lots of things. Had to talk about the Navy a little bit, the boys running their business, the ship they created, and the uh, surprise that the ship received once it was launched. Um, shortly thereafter though, 44, 45, 46, um, he's given the commission to design a bigger uh, ship. Actually, what they really wanted was a ship the same size, more or less. But Gibbs was not going to miss this opportunity. So here are early plans for the, that kind of suggest the layout of the SS United States. On the left-hand side is the military uh, uh, cargo, basically. The passengers, if you're carrying um, 14,000 soldiers. And on the right-hand side, when it's op operating in sort of its commercial duty, it's a uh, private duty, that's the number of passengers, but divided into blocks so you can quickly compare. 
this ship would, um, you know, and safely carry them, and very quickly. It was designed and kept narrow enough so that it could go through the Panama Canal, so they could cut through um, to the uh, Pacific Ocean, just in case something should happen on the Korean Peninsula. The engineering inside it, the, uh, the engines, the boilers, and so on and so forth, again, the most complex. A double hull, compartmentalized, 20 compartments now. Um, the plants for each of the decks, the drafting uh, room below. Um, now we can actually build it. Now we have plans. We build it in a dry dock. That blue thing is a caisson. It's basically a hollow steel box that rests against the end of this bathtub. And once it's in place, the river will push against it and keep it from moving. But once it's in place, you can actually take the water out pump the water out of the dry dock itself, and you've got a space in which you can build a ship. Here's a different view. I decided that earlier view didn't work that well. It was too confusing and didn't show enough. So redraw, um, and there's, there it is, ready to go. All the pieces of the United States were sub-assemblies. All the small parts were put together in bigger parts, and then all the big parts were piled on top of each other and, and, you know, and welded together in, the, in an appropriate fashion in the dry dock. There's uh, a little piece on top. That's the right-hand side. That's the keel, the first section of the keel that will run down the entire 990 feet. Uh, well, not quite that much, but um, early sketch, quick pencil drawing. There's that piece of the keel being lowered. Here's another version of it. You know, I'm always moving around trying to find the best point of view, the point of view that I think will be most interesting, but will also make the information as clear as possible. That's the goal. It has to be dramatic, but it has to be accurate, and it has to be engaging. Nobody said it was going to be easy, however. So here's the drawing inside the dry dock with that piece of the keel being lowered into place. And this is an a, a, a integrated crew, or at least an African-American white mixed crew of shipbuilders in Newport News, Virginia at the time. Never really were sure whether either of those two segments of the uh, working population were given different tasks specifically. So I decided to take advantage of the fact that they're all wearing gloves because they're working with steel. And um, so you have no idea whose hand that is, what color it may be. It may be God's hand, I don't know. But I needed a little place for text on this page. So that piece of paper has text on it in the book. Another hand coming in to lower a piece of the side of the ship, the inner hull, and then the outer hull will be welded into place on the outside and riveted, actually. Um, the center section of the ship divided into compartments, the boiler being lowered into place, the stern of the ship with the rudder assembly and the motor necessary, the engine necessary to actually just turn the rudder because of the size of these things. Propeller uh, shafts being fed into the bossings, which lead eventually to tunnels which connect to the engine rooms. There's more here than you could ever possibly want to know. And I've been struggling to try to squeeze it into as few pages as possible so that even someone who didn't think they could be interested in this kind of technology might just relent and figure, well, it's not that long. Let's just go along for the ride. The bow, heavily reinforced. The anchor housing and the machinery necessary to raise and lower the three anchors. The center section, now we're putting in the pieces of the engine room. Um, and on top, that yellowish area on top, that's, in, that's all aluminum. The bulk of the hull is steel, but everything above the promenade deck is made of aluminum to cut the weight. So again, it didn't have to be that strong. It didn't have to be as strong as steel because it was not resisting the pounding of the waves. In the foreground, also made of aluminum, are the two smokestacks, which were sort of iconic of Gibbs's ships. And uh, uh, the top cap is being put on one of the stacks here. And eventually, they will be cut in half not vertically, but horizontally, and lifted on board in two pieces. They, they're just too big to be handled by the cranes, even at Newport News. Down below, the propellers are being installed on the ends of the shafts, which emerge just enough from the bossings of the hull. This was to be my rough sketch. And this sometimes happens, too. Um, but I knew I couldn't make a better drawing of this situation, so I just decided to clean it up and let it, let it be the drawing. Now, I have to tell you, I'm already working on tracing paper. It doesn't get any shabbier. Um, not only do I not really have any finished art to show, I have nothing on paper that will last more than about six years. 
Um, I've always sketched on tracing paper. I love it. I love working with the pencil, markers, whatever it is. And it was about 10 years ago, maybe, that I finally decided I was going to give up this process, this ritual that I was going through for the first X number of years, right through the way things work, where you do your final sketch on tracing paper, you put it on a light table, you put a piece of expensive paper over it, you trace over that, and then you start inking in over your pencil lines, just so you can say it's on permanent paper and maybe hang it on a wall. But I realized I wasn't making stuff to hang on a wall, I was making stuff to be reproduced. So why was I inflicting this, this pain on myself voluntarily? So anyway, piles of tracing paper is all we have to show plus a finished product with any luck at all. Anyway, we, we just, you see these things grow. Finally, the day comes. Gibbs is sitting there on the caisson. He's watching them flood the, the dry dock. It is no longer a dry dock. Once it's full, the ship will have lifted off its wooden supports, and the caisson can be filled, uh, can be, uh, which is now full of water, can be emptied, and it will float and pop free at the end of the dry dock and can be pulled away, and you now are connected to the uh, river, to the James River. Um, first sketch, you know, the typical kind of launch thing, um, bunting on the podium, a, or a band, hundreds of people sweating down there in Newport News, um, listening to speeches and all that sort of stuff. It was broadcast around the country. Um, so it was a pretty big event, a national event. Um, I decided that that's what I should do, but I, dis I changed my mind. I decided to show what the uh, launch would be like from underneath the water. Now we have this huge 900 foot long hull floating, you know, 12 feet above the wooden structure on which it has rested for a, uh, a year and a half as it's been constructed. You could just see a little bit of red, white, and blue through the water. Um, but I thought this was much more, I mean, you'd say, what is this? And that's the most important question I could get you to ask. We have to do a lot of stuff inside, lifeboats, uh, extra generators, safety features, doors that close automatically, then build out the cabins. This all happens in a, do in a dock about um, some short distance from the, where the ship was built. Here's the finished engine room. Here's the bridge during the sea trials. And here's the payoff for those of you who have actually read the story to this point and just can't believe this can go on any longer. Well, it doesn't actually go on any longer. So we open those pages, and we have a, 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 a fold-out spread that's about five feet long. I wanted it to be much wider than the book itself, so it would be a surprise. And, um, but everything's in there. Missing dog, the different, uh, you know, sort of dining rooms and all that sort of stuff. And finally, the ship that would carry us to the U.S. We're running out of time. Oh yeah, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you the last story, the, for, the, for, the fourth part of the book, because the fourth part of the book is just my story, and nothing happened. <laughs> I was a 10-year-old kid trapped on this ship, um, waiting desperately to see the Empire State Building, and I'll let you thumb through the book to, to you know, get, get the idea of that, all right? Thank you.